Welcome to this last session, this last episode on our series of Know the Bible. And we come now to the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is a marvelous book. In fact, it's the only book that uh, has this little verse in it. Blessed, blessed are those that read, those that hear the words of this book. And so by just reading it or just by hearing it taught, God promises us a blessing. Well, the book of Revelation ends the revelation of God because uh, the Lord says, even in this book, that the spirit of prophecy is a testimony of Jesus. And I'd like to explain that just for a moment. In the book of Isaiah, the people are worshipping idols. And God said, look, you're worshipping those idols and you think that those idols can protect you. Those idols are your gods. Now he said, the truth of whether their God or not is, lies in this fact. Can they declare the future and bring it to pass? But of course, idols can't. It's only God that can declare the future and bring it to pass. And throughout the whole of the Word of God, all the previous 65 chapters, we find that God is speaking through the prophets, the historians, and also his apostles, speaking through them concerning the things that are to come. In the Old Testament, you know, the fact that Jesus was going to come and would die for our sins was very prevalent. Well, that came to pass. And now when we're looking at the New Testament, knowing that all the prophecies of the Old Testament have been fulfilled with the exception of his second coming, we can with great confidence look at this book of Revelation knowing that it tells us of the things that are going to come to pass shortly here upon earth. We know that what God has said in previous books has come to pass. For example, Moses, speaking on the plains of Moab, declared that the Babylonians would indeed come into the land and take the children of Israel captive. That came to pass. That came to pass. And uh, that was about 900 years before that event. Isaiah prophesies some 800 years concerning the birth, life, ministry, and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. All that has come to pass. And so the prophets and the apostles, when they speak of the last days, we have the greatest confidence that that is going to come to pass too. Now the book of Revelation specifically is the book of the last times. And so we're going to look at it. It's broken up into certain parts. Chapter 1 is basically an introduction where the uh, Apostle John speaks of Jesus and this is what he says of him. He said he is, he was, and he is to come. In other words, Jesus is alive. All those who know him can testify of that. He was alive, he walked upon earth, and he's coming again in the clouds. And this has been repeated many times by the prophets and also by the Lord himself. You know that he is coming again. That is great hope of the Christian. So in chapter 1, the Apostle John meets the Lord. Now, in chapters 2 and 3, 
there are the messages of the Lord to seven particular churches. Seven particular churches. Seven particular churches. And John has the apostleship over these seven churches. And God speaks to each of these churches, commending them for what they're doing, but also pointing out places where they're falling short. For example, the church of Ephesus. He commends them highly for many notable virtues, but he says this about them. He said, but you have lost your first love. Repent, or else I'll come and take away the candlestick. The candlestick speaks of the Holy Spirit, the illumination, the revelation that is in the churches that are, you know, walking with God, where the minister speaks under the anointing of God. And he said, you know, I'll take that away unless you repent, because you have left your first love. And I mention this because this is a very important factor. You know, we can know all about the book of Revelation, but the all-important thing is this. You know that we have this burning, flaming fire of love for the Lord Jesus. William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, you know, just before he died, gathered his leaders together. And he said, you know, the nature of fire is to go out. In other words, he was saying to his leaders, keep the fire of God burning in your heart. And this is virtually the message of God to that Ephesian church. You know, keep the burning fire of the love of Jesus in your heart. Then there are other churches he spoke of. And I just want to mention two others, the Philadelphia church, which was a church highly commended by God. Highly commended by God. You know, they were faithful. And God says to them, well, I, because of your faithfulness, you know, and Philadelphia means, as we know, you know, the love of the brethren. They had a deep love for the brethren. They had a deep love for God. And so God, you know, gave them, you know, wonderful promises. And I just like to read these promises. It's in uh, chapter 3. And he said, you'll be a pillar in the temple of my God. You know, what a privilege, you know, throughout all eternity to be in the temple that is in heaven above. And then he goes on to give them further promises. He said, uh, and I will write upon you the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and my new name. Well, it meant, therefore, that their eternal residence would be in the New Jerusalem, that they would have the Father's name on their forehead, and they would be part of the bride of Christ because they would have, indeed, the name, the new name of the Lord Jesus upon their foreheads. And so that's an admirable church. But then I want to look at the last church, the last of the seven churches, Laodicea. And I mention these churches because although they existed in the time of the Apostle John, yet they have relevance to the churches of today. And so often, you know, you go to a church and God will say, well, this is like the Philadelphian church. Or this is like the Ephesian church. They've lost their first love. But unfortunately, many are like the Laodicean church. And the land to see a church says, we're rich. We have need of nothing. And so many are in that condition today. They say, well, we have need of nothing. And God said, oh, well, he said, let me tell you, you're blind and naked. And you ask of me that I will give you, you know, true riches. I will anoint your eyes with eye salve that you can have revelation that your garments will be the garments of salvation and righteousness and also that uh, I will give you true treasures, spiritual treasures. So we must be very careful. And so that basically 
was a message that God gave to those seven churches. Now, we come to chapter 4. And chapter 4 starts with a door open in heaven. And the Apostle John is told that, indeed, he is going to be shown things that are yet to come. So, from chapter 4 onwards, it's all prophetic, and it hasn't yet come to pass. But as we see the signs in the world, we see that it's very shortly going to come to pass. Well, one of the dominant features of these following chapters is what is called the three-tier judgment. The three-tier judgment that's coming upon the world in these last days. The first one is called the seven seals. The next one is called the seven trumpets. And the third one is the seven vials of his wrath. They follow sequentially. And uh, those judgments are going to come upon the earth because of the wickedness of the inhabitants of the earth. One of the things the Lord Jesus spoke of concerning the last days would be that they would be as in the days of Noah. We're told in the book of Genesis that those days were days of great violence. And we're seeing violence covering the earth everywhere. Hardly a nation is being spared violence in these days. And also, you see, the thing is this, that because of that violence, God destroyed the earth with water at the days of Noah. But now he's going to pour forth his seven judgments of the seals, the trumpets, and the vials upon the earth in these last days because of the terrible violence and darkness that covers the earth. All right. Now then, throughout these records of these judgments, God is speaking concerning other things that will be seen upon earth. And I want to speak on these things. You know, in Revelation chapter 11, we are told that the Apostle John was to arise and measure a temple that he was being shown. Now, this temple was not in heaven. This temple is on earth. And when it speaks of the temple of God, there's only one place on earth that would have that temple, and that is Jerusalem. Now, at the time of the writing or the revelation of these facts, it was AD 70. The Emperor Domitian was on the throne in Rome, and John was on the Isle of Patmos suffering persecution. The importance of that is this, that in AD 70, about 20 years beforehand, to fulfill the prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 24 and verses 1 and 2, we find that the temple had been destroyed by the Roman army under Titus. But now in Revelation chapter 11, the things that are to come, you know, John is told to measure the temple. And then he is told not to measure the outer court because that is given over to the Gentiles. Now, the importance of this lies in this fact that if John measured a temple that is to come, it means that a temple has to be built in Jerusalem before the Lord comes again. And that is brought out very succinctly by the Lord himself, when he speaks of the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. And then the Apostle Paul, speaking of the Antichrist, sitting 
in the temple of God, calling himself God. So one very practical application of the book of Gen- uh, Revelation is the fact that there must be a temple built in Jerusalem before the Lord returns. Now also, in Revelation chapter 11, it speaks of two witnesses who indeed will speak forth the word of God and who will be able to turn the water into blood and also be able to shut heaven that there's no rain, apart from other miracles. Well, those two witnesses, obviously, are Moses and Elijah. They're spoken of as the two witnesses who stand before the Lord of the whole earth. And we see them in Matthew chapter 17, on the Mount of Transfiguration, where the two of them stood before the glorified Lord, speaking to him about his crucifixion, along with Peter, James, and John. And the voice of the Father, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. So, in Revelation 11, we're told that Moses and Elijah shall minister in Jerusalem before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That is also prophesied by Malachi, who says that before the Lord comes, Elijah will first be sent to turn the hearts of the sons to the fathers and the fathers to the children. And the Lord confirmed that as he walked down. You know, that Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and they said, well, isn't Elijah to come first? And Jesus said, yes, Elijah will come first. So there we have Revelation chapter 11. Now, we move on to another chapter. And in chapter 13, we are introduced to two very evil people. One is the Antichrist and the other one is the false prophet. Now a description of the Antichrist is clearly given and um, I want to make it very clear and I want to break here from chapter 13 and turn with you to chapter 17 because many things are spoken of, you know, concerning the Antichrist. And we must be very, very clear in our own minds exactly what the Lord says about the Antichrist. Now, you remember that at the beginning we said that, you know, John introduced Jesus as he is, he was, and he is to come. In other words, he's alive now, he was alive, and he's coming in the clouds. But now look at the description of the Antichrist. And it's in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8. And the beast which you saw, meaning the Antichrist. Now I want you to look very carefully at this. He was, he was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the pit. Now, that's a very important description of the Antichrist. In other words, here is John, A.D. 90, and the Antichrist is spoken of as a person who lived long before the Apostle John, was not living at the day and time of the Apostle John, but in due time, he will ascend out of the bottomless pit. And so the Antichrist is someone who lived, is in the pit now, and will ascend out of the pit. And when? Well, in Revelation chapter 11, we're coming back there now, uh, we're told that after Moses and Elijah have fulfilled their ministry for 1260 days, then the beast who ascends from the bottomless pit will fight against them and kill them. And then 
for three and a half days their bodies will be in the streets of Jerusalem and then a voice from heaven they will come alive and then they will ascend in the clouds but you see the point I want to bring out is this that the beast when he ascends will fight against Moses and Elijah and so the beast will not come until that time um we're told in fact that he will make a covenant with Jerusalem with the Jews with the nation of Israel for seven years and then in the middle of it he will break it and he will cause the sacrifices to stop so again we have proof that sacrifices will be reinstituted in Jerusalem and of course they'll only be reinstituted instituted in the outer court of the temple. Now then, in Revelation 13, we are told that this uh, Antichrist is a leopard, and the interpretation of a leopard from Daniel 7 is Greece, and uh, he has feet of a bear, and uh, he speaks like a lion and there in Daniel 7 speaks of Persia or modern day Iran and so it was a man who was a Greek who ruled over Persia and spoke like a lion and a lion interpreted in Daniel 7 is Babylon and so it was someone who had his capital city in Babylon and they say who can fight against the beast in other words an undefeated general and the false prophet arises and the false prophet obviously who is called a prophet today and the thing is this what happens well the false prophet says let us make an image to the antichrist and That is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Jesus in Matthew 24 and verse 15. And then he said, after that comes the great tribulation. Well, we must continue in the book of Revelation. And we come now to the last great battle. And it's a battle that the Antichrist and the false prophet will have gathered all the kings of the east you know with their armies to Armageddon and there we see in chapter 19 the Lord on a white horse with all the armies of heaven on horses coming down to fight against the Antichrist and the false prophet with their armies and the beast and the false prophet are taken prisoner and thrown into the lake of fire. And that's their end. Well, Satan, who's inspired them, is then taken prison and put into the bottomless pit. And the reason being, he's needed. Because after the Lord comes, there is a thousand years of his reign upon earth. But during his reign, there will be those nations, those peoples, that will rebel against his reign, which will be a reign of a rod of iron. I mean, it will be back to the age of the law. It will be very strict. And nations, even the nation of Egypt, we're told in Zechariah chapter 14, will rebel and not come to worship the Lord in the temple of Ezekiel, which will be built after the Lord returns because that temple that the Jews were built and uh, the Antichrist will inhabit will be destroyed and a new temple will be built, the temple of Ezekiel. Well now, after this, you see, after the thousand years, we find that Satan will be released and he will gather all those who oppose in their hearts the Lord Jesus. He will gather them and come against the holy city. 
God will defend that holy city with fire and destroy all those armies that come against the holy city after the thousand year reign of his upon earth and then Satan will be taken and put in the lake of fire where the false prophet and the antichrist will have burnt for a thousand years burnt but not consumed now then what happens after that well we're told glorious things a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness and in chapter 21 of the book of revelation we're given a picture of the new jerusalem coming out of heaven there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and all the nations that are saved will be you know on earth and as the new jerusalem comes down they will have access to that and then in heaven above you know there's that glorious river flowing out from the temple of god and his servants shall be able to behold the beauty of Jesus, the Lamb of God, throughout eternity. And so we find that that is a message of revelation, a message of great hope for all those who love righteousness and hate wickedness, all those who are, have their names in the book of life, for that book will be opened. And if your name is written there, you're in the new heaven and new earth. If not, you're in the lake of fire. May God grant that your name is written in the book of life, which is possible as you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior.